listening to the Web3 Prof Podcast. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am here with uh, Boris Wirtz, who's the founder and general partner of Version One Ventures. Thanks for being with me here today, Boris. Thanks for having me. So let's get started and let's uh, let's just hear a little bit about your journey um, into the world of Web3 or what's your connection with the world of Web3? Yeah, so I'm, I'm an investor, an early stage investor in technology companies. And uh, obviously one of our goals is always to think about what's next. What's the next S-curve? What's the next innovation? Uh, like and uh, pretty early on uh, we started looking at Bitcoin and uh, got excited about that and then scoured the market but it was the wild wild west Um, (laughs) and it was really hard to find a a team that you could back around Bitcoin Um, it was all a little bit too libertarian a little bit too too wild uh, a little bit too illegal Um, but then in 2016 Uh, Ethereum really got traction. And what really excited us was the idea of this is programmable, this is a developer platform, this lets you create other products on top of it. And so that's really where we went all in on on, on crypto and and started investing in that that world. Um, 2016, you know, it it was really a very small ecosystem. Um, Very few investors, very few entrepreneurs. um, And it was a really exciting time uh, and really reminded me a little bit of the the, the early years of the internet, mm. uh, where uh, it was before you know, kind of mainstream got excited about it, uh, kind of really a, a small pure community of evangelists that yeah. really believed in that opportunity. Were you involved in technology before this as well? Yeah, so I was a technology entrepreneur um, okay. since '99. So I've been you know, kind of almost my all professional life in, in technology, first as an entrepreneur, then, uh, then as an investor. So yeah, I yeah, had, had been been in there for, for quite some time. So in 2016, when you started to kind of get into crypto, were you buying Bitcoin or were you investing into like Bitcoin and Ethereum companies? We were investing in companies. Okay. Um, we should have actually <laughs> uh, invested in the currencies. But at the time it felt like, do I really want to invest in a currency and in a store of value that felt a little lame almost, yeah. right? In terms like it wasn't of, exciting uh, enough? Yeah, no, it just felt like, you know, I, I wouldn't go out and buy gold for the fund, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's how it felt like. Mm-hmm. Now we changed our view later on and actually um, started buying um, kind of Ethereum and, 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 and other um, tokens, right? But in the beginning, we, were, we had a little bit too much of our traditional mindset uh, on and, and thinking about companies that were actually building in that space versus the underlying um, value accruing mechanism, which were tokens and currencies. Yeah, okay, that's great. This is the Web3 Prof coming at you. I just want to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors. They make this podcast possible. The CryptoBoutique.ca. They're a really hot website. Sell lots of cool stuff related to crypto, books, clothing, most importantly, cold storage wallets. I encourage you to check out the CryptoBoutique.ca. And one of the products that they sell, which is the Cool Wallet Pro, it's a thin credit card sized device that is cold storage. It takes your your keys, your tokens, removes them from the internet and the security issues that you may face and allows you to hold those keys so that no one can take your coins from you. You know what they say? Not your keys, not your coins. Check out the CryptoBoutique.ca and the Cool Wallet Pro. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about some ideas around disruption. So you've spoken about or, or written about four disruptions that, um, or four waves of disruption that we will be seeing or have seen in uh, in crypto. I'd love to hear, maybe you break down those four different waves that you've, that you've talked about. Yeah, so, so I think for us, it was helpful to think through what are the different elements of crypto and cryptocurrencies and the different waves and what sequence will it happen or it might be happening, mm-hmm. right? Because sometimes people don't really differentiate and, and they just talk about crypto and cryptocurrencies and, uh, and, and, and don't think about specific use cases and, and waves that are happening. But the way we, we thought about it is, is obviously the, the, the first one that is the oldest and most established is kind of the... the the store value concept that is built around Bitcoin. And and I would just think about Bitcoin as a digital gold. It's, uh, um, you know, kind of, there has always been in, since since the beginning of mankind, a definition of what is the stored value that mm. is accepted by a large um, percentage of the population. And uh, the most recent probably was, is, is gold. 
but then Bitcoin is a similar concept in the digital uh, age. It's frictionless. It's much easier to 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 buy, to transport, to transfer um, than in gold. So so it feels to me like this this is the the first um, kind of wave around store of value mm -hmm. and digital gold. So now. Um, the Bitcoin community was never really interested in building, letting other people build on top of Bitcoin. Right? Yeah. I mean, they were always focused on just preserving the status of gold and less change was better. Right? And, and so that really gave the opportunity to, to Ethereum right, as a development platform and kind of as a computer in the cloud. And, uh, um, and that suddenly enables to take the, the, the concept of a digital currency, of a st of store of value to many other markets. Yeah. Right? And uh, that's, I think, where the second wave comes in. Okay, before you go into that, I want to ask you a question. Do you, so you kind of refer to the fact that the like, Bitcoin community doesn't really want new stuff. And, and one challenge I've always had with maximalists is that they seem to have been extremely progressive for a time period in their life to get onto Bitcoin early. And then as soon as they found that, they're like, no more change should happen. So why, why, and I don't know if you can answer this, but why do you think it is that so many Bitcoin maximalists had a very broad view and were able to open their mind to get into this? And as soon as they did, they were like, and nothing else shall ever change. This is the only way forward. We don't want, we don't want ordinals. We don't want, we don't want anything. Maybe the lightning network is about as far as they'll go. Why do you think they're, they're like that? You know, I, I think it's very, very uh, normal and, and native to the human mind that once the stakes get higher, you get more risk averse, right? Okay. And I think it happens in 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 big companies, right? Mm. Like in the beginning, when you start a startup, you have nothing to lose. You, yeah. you take all these risks and then suddenly you have a big company with a big market cap and yeah. suddenly it's like, oh my God, like we shouldn't take that many risks. Right. Like let's just not rock the boat. And I think something similar happened to the Bitcoin community, right? Mm. Everybody was super excited about this new technology. Then it became very valuable, right? And it was clear that uh, there was a huge incentive to just protect what it right. was, right? I mean, listen, it was at some stage over a trillion dollar market cap, yeah. right? And so um, you can say, well, kind of this this has a clear path to being a seven to eight trillion dollar market cap just replacing gold. Mm -hmm. Like, should we really kind of risk it by building other stuff on top of it, perhaps diluting the value proposition yeah. uh, and and uh, taking away the, the, the pure store of value proposition, yeah. right? Okay, that's great. Okay, I think that's helpful. Can you then um, tell us about um, the second stage, the second wave? Yeah, so second wave um, around the Ethereum platform and kind of this programmable interface, right, that, that lets um, people build smart contracts. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the, the first application of that we've seen in financial markets, right? And so around decentralized finance, DeFi, um, kind of this idea of, of building, rebuilding the financial system uh, within, um, within Ethereum um, and, uh, you know, all the different uh, functions. The, the, the first one was a little bit of a false start ICOs, which was basically equity issuance, which um, didn't really work for, for mostly regulatory uh, um, reasons. But later on, we had, we had, um, debt, so take, taking out debt on the blockchain, uh, so so marketplaces for, for for credit. We had exchanges, a Uniswap, like a decentralized exchange, where you can change any any sort of token. Um, we had um, insurance, derivatives, etc. So basically everything you can think about uh, that you can build on the on 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 the on the blockchain. Rebuilding the financial system was 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 being started to 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 build very important aspect also stable coins right so the mm. idea that i can actually have a currency that is pegged uh, to a fiat currency like the us dollar and uh, have a usd um, stable coin right that yeah. makes it much easier to then uh, use crypto um, rails to do uh, things like paying bills or uh, kind of um, payroll etc yeah okay that's excellent so um, the the third stage or the third wave is that where we are today? Do you think, or um, and 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 what is the third wave? Yeah, I think this this is probably a good good uh, um, kind of positioning in terms of that that we're on the third wave. And the third wave for me is what we've seen in financial markets um, will expand to every single information market. Mm -hmm. right? 
And so financial infrastructure was obviously, given that you know, the underlying currencies is a financial product, was the obvious first um, market to go after. But now what we're seeing is really every other finan information market being disrupted uh, by crypto. So we've seen storage, right? Filecoin is one, one of the... Uh, the interesting companies or RV where decentralized storage is making inroads into um, kind of centralized storage markets. We are seeing compute companies like, for example, Render, which has built up a rendering network, decentralized rendering network. Um, we have seen um, companies that provide or platforms, protocols that provide Wi-Fi access like Helium. Um, and so I think we're going to see that across all information markets. Um, we're going to see um, crypto native protocols and, and uh, products being, being applied and providing sometimes a very different, sometimes in a cheaper on, and better alternative to centralized um, instances. Um, so obviously kind of a huge market across many, many different verticals that, that, yeah. that we can see there. So I want to ask you maybe a question about Helium. So I actually have a few Helium miners not really miners, but these, uh, these Wi-Fi devices. And so, so, you know, I create a decentralized internet of, so to speak, but I don't, but I do it on the back of a centralized system. And so how important is decentralization when it's fully based on, in the case of helium, if Telus isn't giving me internet, the helium network doesn't exist. And so there's an element of decentralization there, but it's still based fully on decentralization. We see this sometimes with with different aspects of of Web three, where all everything is stored on, you know, on Amazon, for example. Um, and and so they're just using centralized storage solutions to like decentralize their network or, or whichever. How, how do you see this playing out, or, or does it not even really matter? I think there's two aspects to that. I mean, the, I think the first <clears throat> one is in a fully centralized world, right? It's really hard to create a new decentralized service that is completely right. uh, independent of a centralized world, right? Yeah. I mean, you look at um, the fiat on ramps for Coinbase, uh, Coinbase being a centralized company, like the only way to get money from fiat into the decentralized world is actually you have to have a centralized player in the beginning yeah. that, that builds on that. And the same thing for uh, in, in, in terms of helium, right? Um, so w one thing I would certainly think about, like, what is the, the mechanism to bootstrap a decentralized service, right? Mm -hmm. And then hopefully over time, this gets more decentralized and more independent of, uh, of the centralized world. But there's no world in which you start out 100% decentralized. Yeah. I think the second thing that, that everybody has to really think about is just what needs to be centralized, what needs to be decentralized, right? Um, Decentralization comes at a huge trade-off to performance, um, to costs, right? And so, um, in the beginning, like a lot of people say, like everything needs to be decentralized, but it, it obviously is not always ideal for the customer experience and 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 for the cost. So, from that point of view, I think at some stage we'll see different degrees of decentralization, mm -hmm. and obviously areas where it matters more than less, right? If if it comes to assets, right? Yes, I want to have a fully decentralized service because I really care about having access to these assets and nobody else um, being able to 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 take them away from me. Um, when it comes to some interface, right, that uh, I interact very quickly for a few seconds for for a minute, and then after that, it's done. It doesn't have to be fully decentralized, right? Yeah. Um, this the same thing is uh, you know sometimes for. Um, kind of backup solutions that could be, you know, partly decentral, but partly centralized, right? And uh, um, you know, kind of, I, I just want to make sure that in the case something bad happens, there's a centralized solution to back me up. But it doesn't really kind of influence the decentralization on the on the front end. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the disadvantages. Is like, well, if you're using, I don't know, a cold wallet or or something like that, and you lose everything, there's nobody there to be behind you, and 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 that obviously comes at a cost for the user uh, because some people just aren't simply mature enough or smart enough maybe to deal with some of these responsibilities, right? So they need to have some kind of centralization backing them up or else they're, they're also going to be digging in a garbage dump like that guy in England looking for his keys, right? Um, okay, so the thir the third so then what's the fourth wave? So the fourth wave is take, taking the really abstract view of, of crypto 
and uh, what 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 is being built here. And I think it's like a new economic layer um, on top of 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 economic activity, and and also kind of besides new incentive mechanisms, also a new legal form. So basically, today the normal the normal way um, to run a company, run a project, is incorporate a company. Um, there's a CEO, there's a board of directors, um, there is a public listing, uh, perhaps down the road, there's dividends, etc. But but it really, crypto has this infrastructure um, that lets people run projects in a different way, in a decentralized way. So uh, on, on the one hand side, you have decentralized autonomous organization, DAOs, uh, as the organizational unit. Right? You have tokens as... Um, kind of the, the uh, um, a kind of you can say share certificates uh, ownership um, certificates into in the in the DAO that represent voting rights that might represent economic rights that are much easier to to uh, to link to certain contributions you have uh, made to the DAO um, and so it really becomes an alternative economic system right that um, is super interesting because it, it's going to enable uh, many things that that weren't able before, like large scale uh, collaboration of people, individual contributors, where you can measure their contributions to um, to to that um, protocol, to that project, and reward them in tokens, le- give them a, a vote into the, the 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 future and the direction of 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 that DAO. So I'm really excited about that phase. It will take many more years to kind of mm. get there uh, to scale. I think we have. Um, you know, right now, I would say dozens of DAOs. Um, but, you know, at some side, it might be thousands and, and millions of DAOs mm. that all run the different um, projects as a decentralized organization. So do you think then that there is, or maybe what are some of the drawbacks? So I can imagine, like, uh, you form a DAO, you know, around a company and the voters vote the wrong thing in. Like they make the wrong because they don't collectively understand. Maybe you know they don't know the technology well enough. And you put out here's three three directions we want to go, and they they choose the one that ultimately causes you to fail. So how how do these organizations put trust in the public um, when the public might not really understand maybe the core concepts of what you're actually trying to accomplish? Yeah, listen, I I think the biggest challenge is um, it really lives and dies by the strength of the community that you build around your protocol, mm. right? If there is a bunch of really involved, um, engaged people that, that take their time to really think about proposals and um, contribute to the, to the protocol and trying to understand, then it can be really productive because it's really like it's the best kind of um, shareholders right. or board of directors um, that, that you can imagine, right? But, but obviously, you know, Generally, lots of token holders don't want to be that involved. They right. don't want to um, be be uh, kind of in the position that they have to understand every single proposal, etc. So you can also end up with DAOs where it just there's there's very little uh, input from the community and it doesn't really work well, right? And so um, I I think we're gonna see we have to see three things. I mean, the first one is um, um, we need to have like just more people being involved and in making the work. Um, and I, I think it's, it's an exciting opportunity for, for a bunch of smart people that, that want to put in the work to be, uh, become an active contributor to a DAO uh, and, and, and something they really care about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think secondly, we, we also have to have um, better tools, right, to get people involved. So one of the things like, for example, that has started to, to really take off is delegation of your token ownership. So you're not doing the work, you delegate it to somebody that actually makes it, makes it uh, their full-time job, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, people call them protocol politicians. So really people that kind of collect votes uh, from, from, um, uh, from, uh, um, community? from the community and then go on and create proposal and work with a, with, with a DAO to, uh, to push, push that yeah. forward. They're like right? a represent, like an MP. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, uh, just around economic interests versus political, um, yeah. political interests, right? Um, and then uh, lastly, I think we, like everybody also has to learn how to kind of create this new company form, right? And this new governance form. I mean, it, it took a long time to, to uh, kind of um, create better governance for companies. I mean, that was like a you know, century long process. And so, you know, it, the same thing for, for, for DAOs, um, hopefully that will happen as well. Having said all that, 
obviously, I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that DAOs will, the better, will be the better government's form for all sorts of companies and mm -hmm. projects, right? I mean, ultimately, when you look at uh, the history of technology, new technologies have usually never completely replaced an old technology. It was more, um, they have complement these, these technologies. The old technologies got um, less important in their, um, in, in their importance. Um, and the new ones carved out new niches where they, they provided more value add, but yeah, you know, didn't really, I mean, we still have radio, right? We, we still have newspapers. Um, we still have TV, even though we have all these new technologies yeah. um, that uh, that have emerged over the last uh, decades. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, so you're not saying that DAOs are going to eliminate corporations. And I, I think probably what you're also saying, and correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, you're not saying that all decisions are brought to the DAO members or the token holders. You're saying that certain decisions might be brought to the community. Yeah. And, and that, that's really something that uh, kind of all the DAOs we're involved in, in our portfolio companies, I think everybody's still trying to figure out like, sure. what exactly do you bring to the, the community? How far are proposals um, developed beforehand? Um, I think originally, because out of regulatory reasons, everybody was very worried about taking too many decentralized decentral uh, decisions, right? And driving the ship a little bit too hard. Um, but then realized you can't go with every single design decision or, <laughs> or kind of a little business model twitch um, decision to, to the community. It just yeah. confused them. Nobody has the resources to do that. So we have to figure out the right balance between what is the team that, that is, is basically running the DAO uh, proposing and what is uh, what are the community members kind of responsible for, right? In the same way that a management team works with a board of directors, like, you know, the management team runs the company, the board of directors sets the annual budget and approves the annual budget and kind of comes in for really uh, important decisions, yeah. right? But they're, they're not involved on a day-to-day. -day. Right. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. So some people say that, um, you know, we're in a bubble or this is just mania or this is just the wild, wild west. The, the stage that we're in or the wave that we're in in crypto right now is um, maybe the last wave and it's about to it's about to collapse around us. And this is it. You know, you hear Berkshire Hathaway, you know, they talk about things like that. And so what do you say to people like that? Let's say that crypto is dead or, or this is just hype or this is just, you know, it's too uncontrolled. So. I think first of all, it's very important to to realize that every single new technology um, has created bubbles and hypes. Right? It's it's the nature of it. Um, technology, if it works out right, can create tremendous amount of wealth. Right? And there is a tipping point where enough people think that this is the next big thing and they they jump on it. Right? And so we've seen it obviously with the internet bubble, but we've seen mini mini bubbles. Right? Where people got super excited about a certain new technology and, and pile tons of money into it. I mean, you can, uh, out of a corporate environment, just think about how many tens of billions of dollars Facebook has has piled into uh, VR, AR solutions without a market really being there. So um, so I think bubbles are, are natural uh, to it. And actually, they're actually important because in this phase of overinvestment where everybody gets a little bit too overexcited, you also build infrastructure that you couldn't have built that quickly, right? Um, go back to an internet bubble, um, kind of all of the, the, the cable, the fiber cable that, that got laid into the earth and under the, the, the oceans um, to really speed up the internet. Um, if, if people had been a little bit more realistic how quickly the internet came, nobody would have done that investment. But at the time, people thought like, oh my God, it's going to change everything tomorrow. And we need these cables tomorrow. It's a huge business opportunity. So I think you have what I would call productive speculation where, um, because there's so much money in, 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 in involved and in coming up in a, in a bubble, you really create the infrastructure for future generations around this technology. And actually, it, it really accelerates the, the technology rollout. I've, that's really interesting. I've never heard someone speak about bubbles in that way. And nor did I know that the, like the fiber optics around the world were because of the, so the bubble like in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s you're yeah. referring to. So it's because of that, that um, the internet rapidly got adoption around the world because there was just so much hype. And so we got to do it now. We got to do it now. That's interesting. Um, so so when you look at maybe the last cycle, the last bull market we were in, was there infrastructure that was built quicker 
because of that market that, that, that you can identify? Yeah, so so I think perhaps to, to put it in, 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 in perspective, the challenge around crypto is when there's always a bunch of productive speculation in a bubble and unproductive speculation, <laughs> right? I think the share of unproductive speculation is just much larger in, in crypto than in any other technology oh, ways, right? Yep. And it's partly because it's a financial product at the core. It's a retail-driven product. It's 24-7. It's international, right? And so um, I, I think in crypto, we've just seen way more unproductive speculation uh, into, I mean, you just look at the, the last phase, a lot of the stuff was driven by liquidity mining and incentives and stuff like that that did, created no new technology. It was literally just better incentives to participate and, and keep kind of the, the flywheel going. Right? Yeah. Um, but, but I think when we go, go back and uh, you, you will see, I think, some of the, the, the infrastructure that um, got really created in the, in, in the last bubble and finance in the last bubble was everything around better L1s, uh, layer one mm -hmm. blockchains, uh, more scalable L2s, layer two blockchains that are built on, on layer one blockchains. And uh, kind of all that scalability of, uh, of blockchains, I think got heavily financed against in the last uh, bubble. We, we don't, I mean, we see the first signs that this is working out, um, but that would have, if we look back in 10 years, it was like, yeah, in that phase, we really started to create scalable, uh, blockchains in, in different sorts of, of approaches. Interesting. Uh, and, and a bunch of them will, will not work out, but I think um, a bunch of these approaches look look very promising and have, have shown first signs of, of scaling. Right. Okay. So how important is institutional adoption and um, how do you see institu institutional adoption playing out? Yeah. I mean, so ultimately, uh, I think <coughs> it, it can't be all retail driven. Mm. We need to get institutions into it. I think there's a there's a bunch of really um, in 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 there's a bunch of interest from from institutions to get involved, and we we've seen in the last bubble obviously more and more banks and and uh, and institutions, hedge funds, etc., uh, coming to to uh, um, to to the blockchain. I think we're still very early on that. Um, I think it's mostly um, kind of the, the 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 more innovative companies, the more open companies that are doing uh, interesting stuff. I mean, he, Shopify has been, for example, really, really interesting uh, in, in terms of um, NFTs and, and what, what, what they're building, what they're building there. Um, so when, when we say institutions, we're not just talking about banks. No, I, I think it's like big, a big yeah. companies. Yeah, you, you, when you think about all of the information markets, it could be obviously in DeFi, it's banks, it's yeah. hedge funds, etc. But then when we talk about other information markets, you we're talking about NFTs and you know, kind of what, what Shopify or Nike has been doing in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think we're going to see, hopefully, uh, a whole range of companies and banks and financial institutions joining uh, in, into into the, the, the crypto, crypto world. Okay. So I think right now we have maybe 200 or 250 blockchains out there. Um, we have lots of layer ones, uh, around some, you know, it seems like there's always an, kind of a new layer one or a new layer two coming on the market somewhere. Um, and there's always a lot of hy hype and excitement about that. Maybe we have 20,000 cryptocurrencies or tokens or whatever you want to call them. Do you see further fragmentation um, or do you see some type of con consolidation here to, uh, you know, to, to bring some of these organizations together or that's just a whole bunch of them are going to fail? So a few things on that. Um, the, the first one is what is really interesting in crypto because it's open source. There's no real concept of failing per se. They're always going to be around, right? I mean, like ultimately in, in a company environment, you have companies going bankrupt, running out of money, mm -hmm. right? But um, funny enough, in crypto, nothing will ever die, right? right? Um, open source is always still around, right? And there's even some projects that, you know, you think like they haven't really had any traction, but they still have like a dedicated community of people pushing it <laughs> forward. So it's, it's a little bit um, schizophrenic in, in that way that right. like ultimately, I don't think anything will, will never subtract from the, from the crypto world, right? But having said that, I think attention and resource allocation will certainly uh, concentrate on some of the, the, the biggest winners. And, you know, it feels right now to me that on the layer one uh, level, 
Ethereum has kind of won the game. Um, you know, obviously Bitcoin being the, the store of value and kind of a super important layer one blockchain. Um, but when, when it comes to real, really kind of the, the, the computer and the cloud opportunity, Ethereum has won that. Um, and then there might be you know, other smaller players that, that still have a, might have a, a really good chance. Solana is one of them. Flow um, from, from um, Dapple Apps here in town around NFTs. Um, but, but overall, it feels like th th this, this will be mostly consolidated around um, Ethereum. Having said that, on the layer two, it's still um, kind of to be cited. What will win there? Is, you know, is it optimism? Is it Arbitrum? Is it some other scaling solution? And um, I think we're still seeing rather more approaches in the next little while than less approaches. And then obviously, um, right now, the use cases, right? When we're talking about these 20,000 crypto tokens, right? What are the real use cases right now? Mm. And you know, there, there are a handful or two handfuls, right? And so I hope that we're going to see way more uh, real use cases, different use cases, right? And I, I think one of the things that um, crypto has done a bad job is um, there has been just a lot of a lot of the competition has been really focused not on a technical innovation or a differentiation in terms of product, but more differentiation in terms of incentives, right? And branding, and et cetera. It's just so easy to um, kind of just copy the open source, right? Uh, fork a protocol and just slap a new name on it, uh, provide better incentives. Um, you know, kind of we're investors in, in Uniswap, uh, the leading decentralized exchange, right? And since Uniswap be became very successful in tw 2020, there was like one decentralized exchange after the other that did nothing else than just take the code, try to put better incentives on it, um, um, kind of a, a, a funny marketing, better marketing, better brand, differentiated brand. But but at the core, there was no real differentiation, right? And so I think crypto has to go away from um, just the, the focus on uh, competing on the same product with a, just better incentives to competing actually on a different product and really finding the niches where uh, crypto can be really useful. So I guess if you look at like, yeah, you look at sushi swap or pancake swap, um, they've ripped off Uniswap in the same way. Every layer one has their own version of those things as well. So every single layer one just copies. Well, what did, what did the DEX do on, you know, Ethereum? Well, we're going to build our Solana version of that one or, or whatever it is. And, and, um, and it seems like a lot of the innovation isn't innovation. It's just, yeah, just copying what somebody else has already done, but doing it maybe even just on their own layer one, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So when we look at um, uh, the market evolving here, um, can, you, can you see a way forward where DeFi becomes a, like a positive user experience where like normal people could do this and, uh, and could engage in the financial systems in kind of de some decentralized way? Because right now I, it's complicated and it's not a good user experience. Yeah. Full, fully agree. Um, right now, just when you think about how a new user would engage into DeFi between um, downloading a, a, a wallet, um, getting money into it, uh, starting to engage with the, the whole thing. I think it's 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 way too complicated, right? And so I think there's um, two things that need to happen. I mean, the first one is we need better products, fr more frictionless products um, that work a little bit better, uh, more like Web2, right? Um, and, you know, a bunch of people working on, on better wallets where you have, you know, social recovery mechanism instead of a, a seed phrase that you need to, to, to store somewhere. Um, uh, kind of better, easier onboarding, um, kind of signing up with just an email, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to just better infrastructure that makes some compromises on the decentralization, the, the, the purest approach to it, but is looks much more like a normal internet product. Right? I think the second thing that we need then is also better real use cases, right? So for example, I think... Um, DeFi can be awesome for a uh, foreign exchange retail product, right? I mean, if you have to send money from here to Europe, um, right now you have to go through a bank and pay kind of uh, quite a bit of money and fees or, or transfer-wise, uh, which is also takes takes three or four days mm -hmm. 
and takes quite a bit of fees. Uh, better than the band product, but still not not as good as as um, kind of um, what crypto could deliver in terms of instant um, um, settlement, right? And very small fees, right? Mm. And so I think we just need to come up with with use cases and products that help normal people, right? Yeah. Achieve things that uh, they want to achieve, right? And so I think there's a tremendous amount of um, potential there, but uh, we know, need to focus on kind of frictionless infrastructure and then real use cases that that uh, that people want to want to see implement. So when you look uh, forward, what projects are you excited about, or what type of projects are you excited about? You know, is it AI? Is it the metaverse? Is it decentralized storage? Like what? Are, what? What are you most looking forward to? You know, I, I think in the end, I'm I'm super excited about um, like teams that tackle real world problems, right? Um, in in a in a in a decentralized way, where you say like, well, it's actually it doesn't matter now for a moment if it's centralized or decentralized, but the decentralized product is actually better, right? And it's the only way we can achieve it that way, right? And so. I gave one example beforehand. Render is is a is a is a rendering um, protocol, right? And so the idea that anybody can, um, re- or let's take a step back. Rendering is a very expensive process, right? And uh, if you build a protocol, right, that incentivizes people that have spare computer resources, right, to to give their rendering or their compute into this network, you can actually achieve rendering at, at much lower cost, right? And so this feels to me like one of these areas where like, you know, the Airbnb for rendering compute um, is, is a super, super interesting um, concept. And it's so much better if it's in a decentralized way uh, where you can incentivize these, these uh, kind of incentivize people to, to uh, kind of submit their, their resources to the protocol and then the protocol uh, assigning these resources to to rendering jobs that, that they collect on the demand side, right? And so that's, um, for me, kind of the type of projects I, I'm really getting excited about. I, I get less excited about like an, another um, trading that platform that feels like more circular, like people that have tokens sell tokens to other people <laughs> that also have tokens and hopefully making a little cut in the in the middle, right? But but that feels to me like the kind of project I'm I'm really excited about. Do you make price predictions on Bitcoin or Ethereum? I, I know they're going to be higher. Like I, the, like in 2025. In, like, like what do you what do you think? Where are we at? I think 2025 is a little bit too close to to say what what it is. Because you know I think we're, we're working on and in terms of macroeconomics through through some some big challenges yeah. that might take a long time. Yeah, I think in a 10 year time horizon. Um, I'm 100% convinced that both Bitcoin and Ethereum will be uh, at, at least you know three to five x more worth than than what they are today, and potentially even even, even more. It's really hard to to predict. Um, first of all, like um, kind of, it, it's a new financial system. So what mm. is that worth? I don't know. Um, we are kind of what, what is the end point, right? I mean, it's like. Um, yeah, you know, obviously the, the underlying markets are gigantic, right? If you take the whole financial system or the whole store <laughs> value system, like these are gig- gigantic markets, right? And then I think the second thing is, is really kind of the question is like, how quickly will it happen, right? And we, we had phases where people felt like it was around the corner and then we had phases like right now where it feels like it's further away than ever before <laughs> for regulatory reasons, for reasons of non-scalability of blockchains or kind of the, the lack of real um, real use case, et cetera. I mean, ultimately it always takes a little bit longer than you think. I think the, 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 the idea of a open financial system is, is a very, very powerful one and uh, very much needed in the world. Uh, it will be very much embraced by consumers just the path there might be might be rocky and and sometimes a little little uh, unclear, but uh, the the end destination is is very clear. Yeah, and that's I think that's great. When we, it's always exciting to hear people make price predictions, um, but it's a risky thing to do, especially when you make them in the short term. But uh, you know, when you say like oh, over the last next ten years, three to five x on Ethereum or whichever, I think is is really reasonable for us to for us to consider. Um, this has been really insightful, Boris. I think this has been such a helpful interview to 
to get an understanding of like where we are in crypto adoption and what the future looks like when it relates to you know governance and DAOs and and uh, and and how that's going to look for the future. So I really appreciate you spending some time with us here today. This has been super helpful. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you.